I'm Joy Morris, inviting you to listen to True Stories of the Old West, hosted by C.R. King, a production of R.K. Enterprises. Hello, everybody. C.R. King here. Well, today we're going to go in a different direction. No, still the Wild West, but different. So, let's get going. We have pretty much all taken newspapers for granted. Yes, we read the papers. We read what we want. We don't read what we don't want, what have you. But have you ever thought about the importance of a newspaper in the Old West? Well, we're going to dive into it. Not totally, but enough to give you a taste. So here we go. Now... For decades, the frontier newspapers were hand-set, one letter at a time. They were inputted into the panel that they needed to make the paper. And when they were done, one letter at a time was taken out and put it in its box, designated box, depending upon the letter. This took a whole lot of man hours more than you could ever imagine. But that's what they had to do. For, and they did this for decades, hand set everything. Now, very few newspaper men and women were to become famous. There is an exception. And that exception was Mark Twain. Fewer ever became rich for, for most of them, for many, it was a calling. They had to write. They had to report the news. They had to write their opinions. This was their calling. And what they did, it became known as the fourth estate in the Old West, which was the unofficial term that which referenced its great influence on public affairs. And thus, it was called the fourth, fourth estate. Paper, actual paper to print on, was very rare. So they would use cigar paper, both blue and black cigars. I never seen a blue cigar paper, but they had it. And even the back of wallpaper, whatever it took to get their hands on and to print the paper. The first paper in the Old West was called El Malicano, 1813. It was based in Texas, eastern Texas. It was a Spanish printed newspaper. Jose Alvar del Toro was its owner, publisher, and editor. And the paper's main purpose was devoted to ousting the Spanish rule. Okay? Get it? This paper was important for it was an asset to help the Texans get rid of Santa Ana, El Mexico, to get money to get help for northern states. Now, a year prior to this, a man by the name of Gail Borden opened up two newspapers, the Telegraph and the Texas Register. His columns were printed all throughout the country. It was he, now this is interesting, it was he who coined the phrase, remember the Alamo. Santa Ana hunted him, him down. He had to move his press several times, but he finally found the press and he destroyed it. Well, that didn't give up. Mr. Borden did not give up. He found another press. He brought it in, and he hit it even better. And he continued to publish his papers. Gail Borden, in time, sold his papers. It became rich. He became rich, I should say, selling milk, as in Borden Dairy. It's 150 years old now, that dairy. So while we were on Texas, 
There's one other man I want to mention to you. William Culper Brown. He had a paper in Waco, based in Waco. La Conachas. A Conachas. He was shot and killed. Oh, by the way, Okonosash was the town. He was shot and killed in a gunfight by an irate reader. But he wouldn't be the only one. In Utah, it took three months for a printing press to be delivered to Salt Lake City. And on July 15, 1850, there one was, had been delivered. And on that particular day, the first Desert News newspaper was released. When it comes to journalism, Utah was the worst. In 1858, the Valley Tan was established, and it was not pro-Mormon. It's just the opposite. They were advised by other papers to wear breastplates under their shirt for protection. A reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune was rawhide meaning whipped, published, the publisher for the uh, Algen Morning Rustler was tarred and feathered, ouch. Editors of the Censor and Iron Country Record, again, newspapers, were severely beaten. And the editor for the Daily Reporter committed suicide. His name was Horace W. Myers, and he was 24 years old. In 1874, H. Remington invented and marketed the typewriter. By 1897, the typewriter was on its way to become the standard. That means no more typesetting. And now today, we have the computer. We still have ability to type, but we do it on a computer. It's a lot faster. And this was a milestone for these newspaper people. Charles Klutz, or Klutz, K-U-S-Z, was the editor of the Gringle and Greaser newspaper. Location, Manzano, New Mexico. 1884. It land blasted the Catholic Church as well as the local cattle resellers. At the age of 35, he was shot to death. I wonder if the name of the newspaper had anything to do with it, but I doubt it. He was not the only newspaper man to experience death and other crimes against them, as we are seeing now and you will see more of. Another paper was established earlier than that of the above. It was in 1834. The New Mexico's El Crepuscula Liberate, meaning the Twilight of Liberty. It was short-lived, but it was important. And as you can see, I'm moving around to show you how much people read and how many papers there were about. People were hungry for news. They were hungry for back home. They were hungry to hear from their people, their families. Those who couldn't read would stand around and somebody would read to them and they would pay them. But most of them could read and they did. Tombstone, Arizona Territory. Two papers, The Nugget and The Epitaph. Now, The Nugget appeared to be more pro-cowboy faction, which means they were Democratic-based, because in those days, the Democrats were the conservatives. And the epithet was pro-Erp and his friends, which was Republican progressives. Now, for the historians, these two papers reported the daily life in Tombstone, and it grew as it grew from one person to 2,000 people to 10,000 people. And we all know what happened in Tombstone. And we know about the gunfight at the OK Corral. 
which actually was near the OK Corral. In reality, it was up behind it. So now I'm going to take you away from these dates to California. Richard, called Dip, Fellows, was educated. He even worked as a reporter for the Santa Cruz Echo. Short-lived, uh, it was a short-lived paper, but he also taught English and Spanish. He lived in Los Angeles for eight years. It was prolific. It was a prolific outlaw. He specialized in robbing stagecoaches and was considered to be in the same league as the greatest well-known outlaws of his day. He was captured in San Jose in 1850, sentenced to prison for eight years, but he escaped. Recaptured, and this time he was in for a longer period of time. The paper he worked for, the Echo, seemed to have specialized in temperance. Well, that did not go well. The Echo closed down, and it headed to San Diego. Now, in the town of Columbia, California, the Gazette Press was completely destroyed by vandals. This was in 1851. Apparently, they were very dissatisfied readers. Alta, California. Alta, California newspaper was his name. This paper was the first in California, and a man by the name of John W. Dimber shot and killed the newspaper editor for an editorial that he wrote. It was a negative editorial because Dimber was the head of the Colorado, Kansas Territory, whatever the official name was. He was also a general. Well, he ran for office in 1858, and he was the mayor of Lecompton, Kansas. He wanted to run for president, but he was refused that offer. That he was refused by his party to allow him to run for president, for he committed murder. But yet, the city of Denver is named after this man. Incredible. Moving on, 1860, California had eight, I'm sorry, by 1860, California had over 100 newspapers, 40 of which were published daily. The most successful is the one I just mentioned. The California was its first name, and it added Alta to it, was headquartered in Monterey and San Francisco. The San Francisco bigger paper was called The Call. Then you had the LA, you had the Los Angeles Star and the Los Angeles Times. I used, I have used The Call more often than you could ever imagine in my researches. researches. In one collection, I have well over 500 papers, articles, I should say, from 1871 to 1889. This was from newspapers alone from Kansas. It's an incredible amount of stuff I have read. I can't believe everything the papers write, but it gives you a basis to go on and to start your research. It's important. So, getting back to Harrison Gray, Otis General, he, um, he demanded he be called that. Um, what I didn't mention after talking about the merging of the Daily Times and the Weekly Mirror to form the Los Angeles Times. And that he was a powerful hard ass, and he was. Because in 1910, as an example, because of his power and his narrow views, there was a labor dispute that had now gone on for 20 years. People wanted to unionize. They needed more money. They needed what we, what we need today. Well, the LA Times building was dynamited, and boy, was it damaged tremendously. The men were caught, went to prison, but the damage was there, and the message was there. 
Now this is funny. The Californian and the California Star, two different newspapers, both wrote articles calling the discovery of the of gold in 1848 was nothing but a sham. Boy, did they have egg on their faces when they finally realized that there was indeed gold and a lot of it discovered in Northern California. The rush was on. They had to repute everything they wrote and apologize to their populace. The Star in Los Angeles was a dual language paper. It pushed vigilanteism onto the populace. There were indeed a lot of, of this going on. It was like any other frontier town. Los Angeles had shootings, stabbings, holdups almost daily. The Estrada de Los Angeles, which was part of the Star newspaper, was, was the Spanish version of the Star. They started in 1851, when Los Angeles had a population of 1,500 non-Indians. And they quickly rose in size. Now, let's leave there and go to Nevada. Virginia City, a territorial enterprise, was founded in 1858. Dan DeQuill, his real name was William Wright, worked for the territorial enterprise <coughs> during the Great Rush Silver and, and development of the Comstock Globe. The hardened, knowledgeable reporter, Dan Quill, wrote many stories about the mines and the activities around the city. And this was, like I said, in the late 1850s. He was considered a mining expert by many people, especially the miners themselves. And he was invited into the great mines. It was Dan DeQuill who hired Sam Clemens, who used the pen name Josh as a reporter. Now, he told Sam that Josh would not do after a while. He told him that. And to come up with a better, more fancier, catchy name. And thus, Mark Twain was born. Virginia City was the home of the Comstock Lode, as I mentioned. It's the largest silver mine ever found in our country. George Hearst, the father of Randolph Hearst, was one of its owners. While Dandy Quill was loved and admired, Mark Twain was not. He was a bigot who often wrote controversial articles. He angered many. And finally, finally, he went over the top. And his life was threatened. Dandy Quill tried to save him, tried to block it. But finally, he went to Mark Twain and said, you got to leave Nevada. If you don't leave, you will be killed. Mark Twain left. He went to California. He left a salary of $25 per week behind. That was a lot of money in those days. What happened was, in a short time, he wrote a story. The Jumping Frogs of Calipers County. He left California. A very wealthy and extremely famous man that went back east. We may get into that later about Mark Twain. That it's pretty much guaranteed. Jay Parkinson of the Nevada Tribune and David Session of the Carson City Daily Appeal shot each other over an editorial feud. The Aurora Times in 1863, Robert Draper was crippled for life by a shotgun duel. Alfred Charts of the Eureka Daily Republican kicked a railroad conductor over an argument that was written by him. There were other shootings, fist fighting, angry arguments. Kansas had a numerous had numerous newspapers. Among them was the Codwell Advance, the Wichita Herald, the Dodge City Club, and the Emporium Gazette. 
And it was the Kansas City Chief in, in White Cloud, Kansas. Yes, it was an Indian newspaper. The first. It's because of these papers in Kansas that we know so much about the cow towns of Kansas. And as an historian, they're valuable. It's the beginning. It gives you an idea. They're not always correct what they wrote. You know, they had to interpret things and their memory and did not always be told the truth, but it's a start. It's a start to do your research. I own over 600 of these articles. This is just in Kansas alone. Oh, meaning I copied them. So, moving on. I have two examples of Indian newspapers. The Kansas Chief and the Shawnee Sun. As well as a magazine called the Twin Territories. Subtitled The Indian Magazine. Which was published in February of 1902 by Aura V. By Aura V. Edelman out of the Indian Territory. Her husband purchased the Morning Times and they were devoted Christians. They're considered Christian pioneers and their bent was to convert Indians. The Shawnee Sun printed in, in the Indian language. That much pretty much followed the Baptist Indian Mission which first appeared in 1835. I want to repeat this. The Shawnee Sun was printed in the language of the Indians. And it was pretty much following the Baptist Indian Mission, which first appeared in 1835. For it was a paper for the Indians, but it was produced and edited, edited by white Christians. The editor, J. Clark Swayze, of the Topeka Daily Blade, we're back in Kansas, was shot to death by the son of the owner of the, of the Topeka Commonwealth, which is another newspaper, and they squabbled over honesty. What a way to die. I will stop here. Oh, did I say it was this? Let me repeat that. The editor, J. Clark, Swayze of the Topeka Daily Blade was shot to death by the son of the owner of the Topeka Commonwealth newspaper over a squabble of honesty about their own newspapers. Crazy, isn't it? And there was a Michael Henry de Young with his brother Charles. They opened up their first paper in 1865. It's called the, the Dramatic Chronicles. By 1868, their tabloid became a daily newspaper and was known as the Daily Chronic Chronicles. In 1884, he was shot by businessman Adolf Spreckles, or Spreckles, due to a negative article. Michael was a, was a lucky one. He survived the shooting. Now, I want to stop here. I did this podcast for a reason, because the media is the fourth estate. It maintain, its main function is to report the news, especially that of our government, and to keep them honest. Some in our current world are claiming false news. Well, they're wrong to do so. Perhaps it's better to claim them as overlooked news or headline news only. For the most, our news outlets are controlled by major corporations. And that's where the failure is. The pioneers of yesterday had to battle to fight for their calling. It was hard work and dangerous. They left a legacy of our past so that people such as myself and you could research the past and write about it. Well, that's what I'm doing. There were many more papers and people that were hungry for news. I could write more, and I shall in the future. But this cast 
If this cast is popular for you and the audience wants to know more, I will do it sooner than later. So you see our king here? I bid you well. Please be safe. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Stay tuned for next week's tale.